Hello, congregation, family, and friends. I pray that all is well with you. Welcome to this edition of uh, Bible Study. Got a question for you. Do you consider yourself a fighter? Do you fight for what you believe in? Or are you more of a passive individual? Well, I want to talk to you tonight and show you in this Bible study that we need to be fighters. We need to fight the good fight. We need to be fighting the good fight. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be starting in 2 Timothy. If you're taking notes, we'll be in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we'll be looking at a few verses there. But we're also going to double back into 1 Timothy too, Because I want you to see a pattern of what the Apostle Paul was talking about regarding his son in the faith, Timothy. Now, Timothy was not his biological son. He was his son in the faith. And he was his son that he trained up. And Timothy became the pastor at the church of Ephesus. And there is a difference between a number of years between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. But let me preface all that by saying this. We live in a society and a world that has become increasingly hostile to Christianity. More and more people hate Christians. They hate the name of Jesus. They hate the Bible. Christianity just seems to be the most persecuted faith of all these days. We seem to live in a society and, and in a world that doesn't call what God says is the normality or the way God arranged it is no longer the only option. For instance, uh, marriage is no longer between a male and female. Marriage can be between a male and a male or a female and a female or a male, female, female or a female, female, male. You see how that gets all sorted and twisted beyond what God said. God said he made them male and female, one man, one woman, together in marriage for life until death separates them. That's God's standard. That's not what some of the world says. And even some of the churches have fallen victim to things like this. We, we, God creates a male and female, but we have people actually saying now that you don't have to be any gender whatsoever. You don't have to be male or female, or you can be both, or it just goes on and on and on. Now, I say all of that to say that we as Christians, we have a standard that we must defend. We have a set of rules and commandments and guidelines. It's called the Bible. And it's up to you and I to fight the good fight. We need to stand up for what God says. If you are a true believer today, if God is your God, the Almighty God, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, if you have the gift of eternal life, if your sins have been forgiven, then you and I, we have an obligation to stand up for godly principles, to stand up for what we believe in, and not just roll over and let everything else take precedent. Now, I'm not advocating going out and starting a war. I'm not saying anything like that. But there's too many Christians that seem to be caving in and not fighting the good fight. And I want to show us exactly from Scripture exactly what Paul went through. We all know about the Apostle Paul. We start reading about him in the book of Acts. And when we first meet him, we find out that Paul is a Pharisee, that Paul is, is zealous to persecute Christians. He was there in Acts chapter 7 or chapter 8, wherever that appears, when Stephen became the first martyr and he was getting stoned. Paul actually approved of that. And then he went to the council and he, remember, he got papers giving him the permission and the authority to go and arrest Christians, both male and female, and to persecute them and to put them in jail. Well, you know what happened in Acts chapter 9. Old Paul, who at the time was known as Saul of Tarsus, he got struck down by God, didn't he? And Jesus came to him and said, why are you persecuting me? You can read about that in Acts 9. Well, Saul of Tarsus went blind for three days until a man named Ananias was sent to Paul to tell him and touch him and scales fell from his eyes. And at that point, Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee, the Christian killer, became Paul the Apostle. Now, God had said in, in Acts chapter 9 through Ananias that he was going to show Paul how much he was going to suffer. And as you read through the rest of Acts and you see all of these things that happened to Paul, shipwrecks and imprisonment and stonings and 
the rod, and so on. Again and again and again, you see Paul being run out of town or being uh, escorted out by Christians because his life was in danger. Paul suffered a great deal for the faith. And yet when he got to the end of his life, as we're going to look at in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he was able to say to his young son in the faith, Timothy, I fought the good fight. I stayed the course. And we need to be able to do the same thing. Anything less is not acceptable. Because if we, if we believe in something, we should stand up for what we believe in. Now, I'll be the first to tell you and admit to you that this book here, many people consider this book to be archaic. Some people consider it to be just a bunch of fairy tales, that it, it's not the truth. But if you believe that the Bible is the Word of God, then we need to stand on the Word of God, even if it means being persecuted ourselves. And maybe we need to stand on what God says and not waver. That's what we need to do. So let me show you at the end of Paul's life, it's, tradition holds that Paul was killed, he was beheaded in the year A.D. 67, which was 30 plus years after Jesus was crucified. Now, as we take that as a date here, the very last writing we have of Paul is the letter of 2 Timothy. It was written shortly before he was to die. And so if you were to almost want to read a person's, Paul's last will and testament, the very last words he would ever speak on this earth, it's 2 Timothy. We're going to go to the very last chapter of this second letter that he wrote to Timothy. Now, at this point, Timothy was in Ephesus. He was pastoring a church in Ephesus. And if you want to find out more about the Ephesian church, you can read the letter to the Ephesians. It'll tell you some of the things that they were wrestling with. Now, Paul, ever being the teacher and ever being a preacher, had brought Timothy and also Titus up underneath him so that he could appoint them as pastors in these churches. Titus went off to Crete in Greece, and now Timothy is at Ephesus. But I want you to see here in 2 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 6, this is what Paul says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. He's predicting his own death. He's going to die soon. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Verse 8. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul is basically telling Timothy, I'm going to die soon. He didn't plan to get out of prison. Now at this point, Paul was in prison in Rome. And he is saying, the time of my departure is close. Nero was in charge, and Christians were being persecuted everywhere. And Paul got swept up in this persecution in AD 67, and he was beheaded. That is what the records tell us. And so he's writing one last time to Timothy. And if you read through the letter of 2 Timothy, he's warning him earlier in the fourth chapter of to preach the word in season and out of season because people were going to go after those preachers and those teachers that would tickle their ears because they had itching ears. I preached on this passage before, but he talks about that the time is going to come, he says in verse three, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, that they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Do you see that happening today? It's been happening since the time that Paul wrote this, and it's still happening today. It's proliferating today because we have technology where more and more people can do exactly what I'm doing and coming out and preaching and sending these messages all around the world. You couldn't do that before technology. You had the old, the old style preachers had to go from town to town to town as they were traveling and bringing the word of God. Now you can click on a couple of buttons here and we can go around the world and preaching. And that can be a blessing and a curse at the same time. The blessing is that the word of God can go out around the world much easier and much quicker. The downside of that is because we're living in those days where we see more and more and more people who want their ears tickled. 
And so they don't want to hear exactly what the Bible has to say. They want to hear edited versions. They only want to hear what they want to hear. And so you have preachers that, that come up and call themselves preachers, and they're nothing more than motivational speakers, and they make you feel good. And you can go to their church or go to their service, and there's no conviction. There's no deliverance. There's no repentance. There's no kind of conscience there. You just kind of go, and it feels good, and you leave, and you did your obligation. And Paul is warning about things like that in this chapter where he's saying, Timothy, these things are going to happen, and you're going to have to endure this. But preach the word and preach sound doctrine, because when these things start happening, you have to be ready for them. And so he continues to tell Timothy in verse 4 of 2 Timothy 4, he said, they're going to turn away their ears from the truth, and they will turn aside to myths. Do you see that happening today? How many people do you know? Maybe you got caught up in that, where you used to believe something that was biblical, and now, yes, now you're a little lukewarm on it. You're turning away from the truth onto myths. You're turning onto things that just simply are not true. That's what a myth is. A myth is something that is not true. And we justify our behavior, don't we? We justify what we do. I'll give you a great example. I'll give you an example. Let's say you decide you're going to the movies. Now, the movie you go to has a PG rating, and maybe there's one or two bad words in it. But you justify it because it's a great movie and the plot is good. And then you go to the next movie. It has a little bit more bad language and maybe a scene, that's a suggestive scene. But you justify it again in your head because it's a good movie and it's a good moral lesson and so on and so on. Next thing you know, you're watching things and you're hearing things that you, should, you have no business doing. Why? You let the devil creep in. You let Satan creep in and start tearing down your faith and your ears start getting tickled and your eyes start wandering. And suddenly you're no longer fighting the good fight. You have been conquered. You've been taken over. Satan has gotten you. And suddenly you go from being a Christian who is walking in alliance with God, who living a godly holy life to the very best of our ability, realizing that we're going to sin and we repent and we receive that forgiveness of sins and we keep going. And suddenly we find ourselves falling in with the wrong kind of friends or doing the wrong activities, watching the wrong things, hearing the wrong things, reading the wrong things. Suddenly we, we used to study scripture. We don't touch it now because it would convict us. And why go to hear a preacher that's talking about hell and damnation and all of those ugly things? Why would you do that when you can hear someone that can make you feel good? Or better yet, not even go at all. Where's our fight? Paul is saying here to Timothy, these things are going to happen. And Paul is telling you and he's telling me tonight as we're broadcasting this, he's telling us the same thing. These things are happening. These things are going to continue to happen. And so just the way he told Timothy, he's telling us. He says in verse 7, I have fought the good fight. Past tense. I fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I've kept the faith. The three aphorisms he's saying here. I have run the course and finished it. I've kept the faith and I have fought the good fight. Now I want to take you back here, if you go back one book earlier to 1 Timothy, and to the best of the best knowledge that we have is that there's probably uh, an eight or nine year gap between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Okay? So 1 Timothy, obviously he's still training. Timothy is a young, a young up-and-coming Christian, and he is just being appointed into Ephesus. By the time 2 Timothy comes around, he's already entrenched in Ephesus for a minimum of four years, if not more. But I want you to see how Paul was leading by example. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we talk about this phrase, fighting the good fight, or fighting the fight, or keeping the faith, those sort of things. Look with me in 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Here's what he said to Timothy. He said, this command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, and that is that he was, he, was, he was raised up by his mother and his grandmother, raised up to be a godly young man, and he was going to be serving the Lord. 
He said, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. Notice it's the present tense. You fight the good fight. Verse 19, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regards to their faith. And then in verse 20, if you continue, he talks about Hymenaeus and Alexander. Those are two people that were in the faith and they came out of the faith. They were the people that, that got they got swayed differently. They didn't keep the faith. They didn't fight the fight, and they suffered shipwreck. It says, because they have rejected the truth. They have rejected the truth. Now, I want you to see here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul is talking present tense, you keep the faith. You keep the faith. And don't be like Hymenaeus and Alexander and other people that have abandoned the faith. They rejected the truth. Don't do that. You are to keep the faith, it says, keeping it with a good conscience, conscience, which some have rejected. And so if he's instructing young Timothy, fight the fight and keep the faith with a good conscience. Be always mindful of what you're thinking of, what you're believing, and be able to defend what you believe at all times. Look, you and I are going to be persecuted for our faith. We may not have to give our lives for our faith. We have brothers and sisters all around the world at this very moment who are being persecuted for their faith. We happen to live in a country where we do have persecution, but it's not nearly to the degree that our brothers and sisters have in other countries. And we can thank God for his mercy. But suppose the day comes when you are required to give your life for the faith. Are you going to do it? Or are you going to veer away from it? Are you going to reject it? Are you going to fight the good fight until your very last breath? Are you going to keep the faith? Are you going to run the race? Or are we going to succumb to peer pressure or society's twisted views as to what is accurate and normal and what is not? Are we going to stick with what God tells us as believing Christians? Or are we going to become the flavor of the month the next time some weird kind of perverse belief or some kind of strange scientific thing is made that has absolutely nothing to do with the Bible and cannot be proved? Are we still going to fight the good fight? Are we still going to keep the faith and run the course? Now, I want you to see a little bit later in 1 Timothy, if you go to chapter 6, because I want you to see the continuity of this. And I challenge you also. I challenge you to read the letters of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy is only six chapters long. 2 Timothy is four chapters. We're talking 10 chapters. If you want to read one one night and one the next night, but if you want to get a total understanding of what Paul is talking about and how he was training this young man, Timothy, you need to read both of them back to back to understand exactly where Timothy was facing, the challenges he was facing, and the, the enemies that were going to come against him and how Paul was preparing him. Paul wasn't just an evangelist. He was, he was a pastor. He cared for the young men that were under him. And as a pastor myself, I have to care for the people that, that I minister to. The flock that God has given me through three different states, seven or eight different churches uh, over the last 30 plus years. I have a responsibility to those people that are sitting under me, that I teach them and I preach the truth to them. And I teach and train them, those that are interested in ministry, to the very best of my ability, but using God's word as the guidelines, not what the world says. Because if we listen to the world, see, the world has already fallen. The world is already doomed. We're told in the Bible that this world one day is going to be destroyed by fire because God cannot redeem it the way it is right now. It is, it is a dead in sin world. And each day we're polluting it more and more. And more and more things that God says are right, people say are wrong. Well, I don't know about you. I believe God. I believe his word. And if God says it, then I believe it, and that settles it, and that's it. That's what I believe, because I'm fighting the fight. I'm keeping the faith. I'm going to run my race, and whether I have one more hour 
one more day, one more year, or God gives me 10 years, however long I have, I'm going to finish my race because this is what God has called me to do. And I'm going to stand up against those that say Christianity is hogwash. I'm not going out there and starting any kind of fights and wars and things like that. But if I see something that's wrong, we have to identify it. We have to stand for the word of God. And what I'm saying to you in this Bible study, in this message is this. Wherever you're at right now, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior and you believe the Bible is the word of God, then you have an obligation. You have an obligation to fight the good fight. Not any old fight, not just to be in a fight, but fight the good fight the righteous fight, the biblical fight. If someone came to you, and I've used this example before, and you've seen this on, on news before. If someone had a gun to your head and said, if you reject Jesus right now and tell me he's not the Lord and Savior of your life, and you're not a Christian, I'll let you live. But if you say that he is, I'm going to shoot you and you'll die. What would you do? Someday we may be called to do that. Are we going to fight the fight or are we going to slink off and not have a fight? Look what he says here. First Timothy chapter six. He says it again. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in your presence of many witnesses. What was he telling Timothy? You came to truth. You gave a confession. You received the gift of eternal life. Now, because you have those things, Timothy, you need to fight the good fight. Stand your ground. And elsewhere in these letters, he talks about all of these things that are going to be happening, and it's still happening today. It says here, I want you to read it for yourself. I'm not going to go through all of it because I don't want to get too far off my main point. Just read these two letters, and you will see that as much as it was happening then, it has multiplied today. So what is our solution? What are we talking about when it comes to fighting the fight? We are to stand on the word of God as the absolute truth. Those of you who follow me, those of you that have been watching me for a while, those of you that, that follow my tweets and follow me on Facebook and so on, you know that I, I, I tend to harp on the same things, don't I? I tend to say the same things over and over. First of all, because I don't know who's reading it from day to day and who might see it. But I have a responsibility to share scripture and to share the truth. To share the truth as God reveals it. There's only one truth, and you've heard me say this before. There's one truth. It's called God's truth. There's not many truths. There's not many different books that can get you to truth. There's one book. It's called the Bible. And there's one truth. It's what God has given us in his word. And we all have a choice, you see. We have a choice. We can accept it and fight the good fight, or we can reject it and be swept away because we have rejected what God has given us. Let me encourage you as we are closing out this study today. Fight the good fight. Stay the course. Don't let anyone or anything disrupt your faith or or turn you sideways be careful of temptations be careful the way jesus told us in matthew that that people will come and, and they're ravening wolves they look like sheep they look like nice people but they're coming to destroy you we need to be on our game we need to be in the word every day you need to study this the way I have to study it. And when we come to truth, we need to defend it. And that is, that is what God has laid on my heart for this Bible study. Fighting the good fight. You can do it, and I can do it. Because Paul said what was waiting for him. What was waiting for him after he was beheaded, he said, let's go back to this again. This is what he had to look forward to. This is the difference between rejecting truth and accepting truth. After he said, I have fought the good fight in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I have kept the faith. You'll notice that in 1 Timothy, it was present tense. Fight it. Now he's saying, I have fought it. I have run it. Paul was at the end of his race. He had kept the faith. 
from the time on the Damascus road that God struck him down to the time he came, became a believer, to the time his eyes were open, to all the years he spent in ministry, he kept the fight. And look what his reward is, verse 8. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Paul didn't get that on his own. You and I don't get a crown of righteousness because of what we did. It's what Jesus did for us. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. All of the true believers will receive that crown of righteousness. And that is why we must fight the good fight. That is why we must stand our ground, not back down. And if God says it, we need to share it as God gave it to us. Yes, we'll be hated. Yes, we'll be shunned. Yes, people will not want to associate with us anymore. It's happened to me over and over again. You always run the risk when you come out here on social media that someone's going to come in here with a smart remark or curse you out. Or I've had all of that. Oh, I've had it. If you've done broadcast, you've probably had it as well. It happens. Let me encourage you as we end. Fight the good fight. Stand your ground. Stand on the word of God. It's the only truth there is. If this Bible study has helped you, let me encourage you to share it with someone else who may want to hear it. And may need to hear this. They may just need to, that, that boost to keep them going. Maybe they're wavering in their faith. They need to hear a message like this. Isaiah 55, 11, God says that his word will not return void. It will reach all those people he intends it to reach. So if it's reached you today, if it's, if it's caused you to think, then this was meant for you today. And I would just encourage you to share it. The other thing I always say is to be a Berean. Acts 17, 11 tells us that the Bereans were more noble than all others. Why? They weren't smarter. They weren't richer. Here's what they did. If you read about it, Acts 17, 11 says that they received the word with all readiness. Paul and Silas were preaching the gospel to them, and they heard it. Their eyes were open. Their ears were open. Their hearts were ready to receive the word, but they didn't stop there. The Bible says they then searched the scriptures daily, every day, daily to make sure what they were hearing was true. They were running the race. They were staying firm right on the course, and they were making sure that they were keeping the faith by making sure that everything they heard, they could check out in the Bible and make sure what they were hearing was true. You need to do the same thing the same way I do. Be a faithful and diligent Berean. Whether it's me, someone else that you listen to on the radio, Maybe someone you watch on Christian television. Maybe you go to a local church. Maybe you're plugged into a Bible study. Maybe you follow others out here on social media. And Lord knows there's plenty of them out here. And a, a lot of them are not very good. They're not preaching real good stuff. But you owe it to yourself to be a faithful Berean. To say, wait a minute. Now they preached on this. And these are the scriptures they gave. Is this really true? And investigate it for yourself. Study the Bible for yourself. And let the Holy Spirit open your eyes to make sure that you have truth. There's only one truth. It's God's truth. It's the word. And we all should be Bereans. Lastly, would you please pray for this ministry? As you can tell, I tend to, you know, get a little loud sometimes and I'm bold. This ministry has come under attack in recent months, almost to the point where we got wiped out. Um, we were getting some financial support for a while and that's all gone. And Satan doesn't like what we do. I've had to cut back the broadcast schedule because we've had to do some other things to raise some income and so on. And that's fine. That's where we're at right now with God. But would you pray for this ministry that I stay strong on the front lines? No backing up, no quitting, no retreat, because this pastor and this preacher is never going to compromise the gospel. You're going to hear the whole counsel of God here. You're going to hear the nice topics and the unhappy topics and those that make us a little bit jittery. You're going to hear it all here because we have to preach the entire Bible, not just the parts that people like. But because of that, and because we're under persecution, would you just keep us in your prayers? And if God would lead you to support us financially, Lord knows we could use that. Get in touch with me personally. Reach me on one of these platforms that you see me on, and let's talk about how you could help us financially. But even if you don't, it's okay. I want you to come back for every single broadcast. And anytime that you see me post something or post a, a, a previous video that I'm resharing, you feel free to share it with whoever you want 
because this is God's word going out, and God said his word will not return void. Somebody's going to hear this word, and somebody's going to hear all of the words that I brought, all the messages. And so I want to thank you for being part of this Bible study. Please, let's join each other again. God bless you.